So I'm gonna be talking about uh, uh, filtering for landscape and um, creating a, what I call evocative landscape images through the application of, of filters. And um, I, one of the things that I get uh, a lot is wh why filter? And uh, I will be going into uh, that and uh, why I filter as well as how I filter. Um, one of the things that, uh, for those folks that know me, know my work, um, I post uh, on my work on Facebook quite a bit and somewhat on, on Instagram. And usually with those, I give a pretty detailed account of the, um, the making of the photograph as far as what I use as, as camera settings and any filters. Um, and those of you that have followed me know that I, have, I started using Vue a number of years ago, which then became Benro. And now just recently I have switched filter systems. I've gone to the Nisi filter system. Um, one of the big reasons that I have switched is because of the way that they have constructed the holder. And if you can see me, you can see I'm holding this holder right here in my hand. This is a little easier to do when it's on a camera. But one of the biggest problems with any filter system is changing out a polarizer and being able to add filters in front of the polarizer uh, once you know, you've, you've got that system on the camera. And the, um, the, the Benro system was very, very difficult to switch out the polarizing filter where this system is quite easy. It just pops right out. It's a bayonet system. And so the, the filter just um, drops into the mount with a bayonet and you just turn it. And I love that about it. And th that right there was enough to say, boy, if I'm gonna be recommending filter systems um, for people to go out and get, this is the one because of, uh, for that development alone, the filters are, um, filters are sort of filters, especially when you're dealing with the upper end ones. Um, and the, the Nisi filters are glass. They're, they're optically pure glass. The Benro were also glass. I prefer glass over the resin filters. I think they tend to be a little bit truer as far as color um, and have less shifts uh, to them. So uh, I, I would say any filter that's glass is sort of, they're all pretty similar. And you can use Benro filters or view filters or even um, any 100 millimeter filter you can use with the Nisi holding, holder system and vice versa. So uh, I thought I'd just put this right out right away. This is what I carry in my filter kit. Uh, which, by the way, is another thing that's kind of nice about that Nisi system is they have this great filter bag that you saw a photograph of to carry the, the filters with. So I have the filter holder. I have a polarizer. Uh, I have a four-stop straight neutral density filter. I have a six-stop straight neutral density filter and a 10-stop straight neutral density filter. I then have a three-stop soft graduated neutral density filter a four-stop soft graduated neutral density filter, and a five-stop soft graduated neutral density filter, and then also a one-and-a-half-stop hard graduated neutral density filter. And I'll talk a little bit more about what a, each of these are, how they work, and how I use them. So uh, in it, as you saw, in addition to the introduction, I'm going to be doing uh, talk about a creative, what I call a creative aesthetic in the field, which is one of the reasons why I use filters, different types of filters. I'm going to be talking about specifically polarizing filter and filtering for waterfalls. I'll talk about graduated neutral density filters and using time to create visual effects. And then also understanding the relationship between ISO shutter speed and aperture when you're using filters. I love this quote. In part because um, who knew that there were 15th century Aztec poets and philosophers that were writing stuff down that we still have today. So um, I'm going to start with just a little introduction of showing the work that I do. Um, 
And uh, that will give you a little better idea of the sort of photographer that I am, what I like to photograph and, and um, how I use filters. Oh yeah, I remember those days. <laughs> Haven't done too many winter photos lately. So that's some of the work that I've done. I do uh, a fair amount of black and white. I like black and white. You saw a lot of the work from the Southwest as well as some from Mexico down here um, that I've been doing. One of the reasons why I like to use filters is because you create a, a way to work in the field. Um, I get one of the common things, common comments that I get is why, why filter? You can do that in post-process. You can use graduated uh, uh, um, neutral density filters in post-process, um, <clears throat> and you can get most of the effects that you do with filters in post-process. And to a certain degree, that's true. Um, there's a, there is a couple exceptions to that. One, if you're working in a situation where there is an extreme dynamic range uh, that exceeds what your camera's um, uh, capability is, whether your camera has, your, all cameras have a certain dynamic range ability and they tend to range anywhere from about 11 stops to 14 stops these days, somewhere in that gamut is where your camera lies. And if it exceeds that, uh, it's either going to get blasted out white or be too dark. Um, and, the gra and using things like graduated neutral density filters allows you to extend that dynamic range so that you get more than what the camera can get. So you can't do it all in post-process. Also, most cameras don't have built-in neutral density filters. Some do. Uh, the Olympus cameras, for instance, have built-in neutral density filters. I believe the Panasonic does too. Um, so you do have some ability there, but those also tend to be limited. I think the Olympus is limited to something like five stops where there are times when, certainly times when I wanna go beyond that, well beyond that. Um, also, I, I like using filters in the field because it slows me down and it gives me an opportunity to fiddle more with the camera. And um, quite honestly, I like that. Uh, I come from working with a large format. Uh, I did a lot of work with a medium and large format view camera. And I enjoyed that as part of the process of taking the photographs. It sort of slowed me down. It, it made me think more about what I was doing and what I was seeing and how I was arranging things. So the filters um, have replaced some of the, um, uh, fiddling around that I used to do with the four by five. And so it kind of gives me an excuse to play more with a camera before I take a photograph. So I just like that process. Um, also, I find that when I work with filters and I work with filters quite a bit in the field, that uh, as I look at what I see on the back of the camera, it alters and changes what it is that I respond to in the scene and how I approach it. So in this particular one, with a long exposure that I created here with this image, I, I really liked how smooth the water was of the lake. So I wanted to include more of that. Uh, so I rearranged where I was photographing from so that I could incorporate more of the lake and more of that nice smooth element uh, as part of the composition. Um, and then uh, I added, uh, the graduated neutral density filter, you see there was a prominent color shift in this one as well. 
And then I went even longer uh, with the exposure to smooth it out even more and create a softness to that grass that's in the foreground there. So as I see the scene, the scene will change and develop based on how I'm filtering and what I'm doing with those filters, which may alter how and what I photograph. In this particular scene, there was a fair amount of movement that is um, going on with the ice in this particular little inlet. And I noticed that that one chunk of ice, which is off to the right, right there, didn't move during a 30 second exposure. It was hung up on a rock. And so it stayed stationary while the other stuff moved. And I thought, well, that's a neat uh, element that I can use um, in the, the image. And so I made I mean, that more prominent in the scene. I placed it front and center in the frame so that it became a significant part of the composition and allowed that movement around it to create a sense of motion and time with a solitary piece of ice in the middle. <clears throat> so that's why I like to filter. Um, there are a number of different types of filters and you can see them here. I've got them laid out. You've got the thread on filters. Um, uh, you've got uh, a series of the thread on filters that can be neutral density filters or polarizers. There's also a split neutral density here. That's a thread on. I don't like those because that places that split between the um, heavier density and the lighter part smack dab in the middle of the frame, which is where typically where the horizon would be placed. And that's the least desirable place to put your horizon. So using a system, which is a holder that you see here that consists of this round ring and the, um, this piece right here, which attaches to that round ring. And that allows you to put in these flat uh, neutral density filters. Uh, you can have the graduated ones, which you see a pair here, or the solid neutral densities of varying density there. Um, I'm also not a big fan of the adjustable neutral density filters. Basically what the adjustable neutral density filters are, are two polarizers that cancel each other out. <clears throat> and as you will see when I present a section on polarizing, polarizers have to be used very carefully because if you don't use them carefully, you can get adverse effects. And then when you put two polarizers in front of your lens and start playing with them, you're asking for trouble. So I don't like those adjustable neutral density filters because of that reason. They uh, open you up for a host of issues that you don't need. I much prefer the single density, neutral densities of either a four stop, six stop. I actually also have an eight stop and a 10 stop. Um, mostly I carry the four, six and 10. Those are the ones that I use the most. And I can kind of work around uh, whatever I need by changing other things. And I'll talk more about that later, changing the, that relationship between ISO and uh, shutter speed and aperture and how I can alter those. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Yeah, John, I have a question. Uh, okay. I started using uh, uh, filters after seeing uh, you give this presentation before uh, when you're using uh, VU filters. And so my question is, is does the uh, polarizer that I would have with my VU filter, which I think is an 80 millimeter uh, polarizer, uh, work with the uh, Nizi uh, filter holder? Um, not the version 7, not the, the Nisi version 7, which is what you want if you go to the Nisi system for the holder. Um, your filter is an 82 millimeter. It's a very thin, slim line polarizer, which is what the Nisi is, but the difference is the mount. Yours is a thread mount, so it threads into okay. that ring. And that is very difficult to get that thing in and out of there, especially when it's cold. A Minnesota winter, like, like the weather you're having right now, 
boy, let me tell you, it was tough. So what I ended up doing was I ended up buying extra rings and I would just, I would, I would put the polarizing filter in a ring and just have that separate and then have a blank ring if I didn't want to polarize and have to switch out the rings. Um, and that's the, the way that I took care of the problem when I was working with the uh, view or the Benro system. And it's a very good system and it, and it can work really well. And that, that's how I solved that. What's nice about the Nisi system is you don't have to buy the extra rings. You don't have to be swapping rings out. It's a bayonet mount, which is uh, different. So it won't work that the two are not compatible to take a polarizer from one and try to use it with the other system. Yeah, I assume that the uh, square and rectangular filters uh, are 100 millimeters. So the ones that I would have would work in the Nisi uh, holder. That's correct. If you're working with 100 millimeter filters, um, unless you get the Schneider, what are those things called? They're double thick, um, so they're th really, really thick. But I, you'd have to, they're, a, they're really developed for the cinema, for the movie industry, not for still photography. So you'd have to dig deep to find a set of those. But it, it, just about any of the popular 100 millimeters, uh, Singray, Lee, uh, Benro, View, uh, Nisi, they're all interchangeable with each other's holders. So that's Thank you. a really good thing. Okay. Thank yep. you. <clears throat> so the polarizing filter, I would say it's probably the most owned, least used, and least understood filter. Um, and so I'm going to try to talk a little bit about some tips on uh, using the polarizing filter, when to use it, uh, when to rely on it and what to watch for. So the first thing you need to know that they, a polarizing filter will rob you uh, from anywhere from one to two stops of light, depending on the type of, of polarizing filter that you have. Um, the Nisi as well as the Benro uh, are what are called a high transmission uh, polarizer and they only uh, take one stop of light away. So if you're using it in a situation where you need really fast shutter speeds or something, photographing, say, birds or, or people or something like that, just be aware that when you put the polarizer on, you are, it does cost you, uh, uh, it slows your shutter speed down about a stop. So using the polarizer is one of the most apparent things that you'll see is it really pops the clouds, it makes the clouds stand out. You can see here that the difference between these two images is I've activated the polarizer and the clouds really pop out. You'll also notice that the image sort of looks a little bit warmer. Polarizing filters tend to warm up a scene a little bit. Uh, it's not quite as cool, it cuts some of that haze or UV light. Um, so the main thing with using a polarizer is that it will reduce glare. And glare can happen in a number of different ways and a number of different forms. So take a look at this image. The first thing you're gonna see is that the sky darkens, right? But you've also removed the glare on the red roof, the glare on the glass around the light, and the glare on the, um, that's coming off the walkway and the grass in the foreground. So here, here's our, our previous one. And there's glare on all those things. There's glare on that glass, there's glare on the building roof, there's glare on the grass in the foreground and there's glare coming off of the stone in the foreground. And that reduces that glare and richens the color up throughout the whole thing, deepens that sky down and reduces that glare or flare that's coming off of it. If you're working with uh, reflecting areas, reflecting ponds like this one, this is a, a, um, uh, it's a tide pool that is uh, along the ocean and uh, it had a, a sort of a glare on the surface because it was cloudy day. And so I used my polarizing filter and you get that sense of depth into that tide pool like you can just climb right into it. If you're doing any kind of close-up work, <clears throat> working, I've done a lot of wildflower photography in my career and I would always put a polarizer on because the surface of the vegetative matter has oils or moisture on it which creates a glare. And when you use the polarizer, it reduces that glare and it richens up the color uh, quite a bit. 
So using a polarizer for close-up work or flower photography is um, what I consider a necessity. <clears throat> One of the um, <clears throat> issues that you can get with a polarizer, and it's happened, I know it happened to me. I went out and shot a bunch of stuff and I went, what the heck? I got this terrible band uh, in the middle of my photographs. I'm not using that polarizer again. And I put it away and didn't use it for years because I didn't understand what was going on. So when you are shooting roughly, um, 90 degrees or so, it doesn't have to be a perfect 90 degrees, but at an angle from the sun, particularly with a wide angle lens, and you use the polarizer, you are very apt to get this effect where you see the center of the sky as being much darker and it's light on the two corners. And it's a very um, uh, um, displeasing effect that you don't want. So if you are working on a stark clear day with a wide angle lens, you might wanna think twice before you put the polarizer on. And if you do put the polarizer on, you have to be particularly uh, careful and sensitive to what is happening and look for this effect. You can see it if you look for it. Um, so keep an eye open for it and look at the image uh, as you activate the polarizer to see if you're activating it too much. There are many, many times where I'll put the polarizer on and I will very carefully turn the polarizing filter to see the effect of the polarization. The polarizer spins independent of the lens and the focus, um, unless you have a very inexpensive kit lens where the whole front end of the thing will spin. Then you have to be careful to hold your focus while you're turning your polarizer. But you can watch the effect of the polarization appear and disappear. It's just like, you know, I mean, when you're bored and you're driving down the road and you got the polarizing sunglasses on and you're, you're tilting your head sideways from one side to the other to see the effect. It's the very same thing with a polarizing filter uh, on the front of your lens. So just watch what you're doing and see what the effect is. <clears throat> Any questions on polarizing? <clears throat> Excuse me. There's no chats that I can see. Okay, we'll keep moving. So uh, when you work with neutral density filters, the first thing that you have to understand is that there is no such thing as a neutral neutral density filter. Um, almost all filters will shift color to a certain degree when you apply a neutral density filter. It's just inherent in the system. Um, the question is whether or not the shift is um, either uh, uh, desirable or if it's not correctable. So cheat filters will give you a shift. <clears throat> when I first started working with filters, I, I saw, I went out and I went, oh, look at this. Uh, I believe it was. Um, not to pick on names, but I think it was a Hoya. Um, I can get a Hoya 10 stop neutral density filter for half the cost of um, this other brand. So I bought the, the Hoya and I shot with it one time and I got this God awful magenta shift that was just, it was terrible. It was muddy and it, it, it just muddied up the greens, something terrible. And there was no correcting. I could not do a color correction to get rid of it. But so here we have no filter. Here we've applied a six stop neutral density filter. This was uh, an earlier one. This is not a Nisi, nor does a Benro. I don't think that either of those are quite as dramatic as what this one was. This was one of those Schneider ones uh, that I used for a while. And it had a very prominent shift to the blue that you see, but all filters will shift most of the better ones are gonna shift more to the blue, but sometimes you get them shifting a little on the um, warm side as well. Um, so again, no filter, six stop, very prominent blue shift to this one, blue or cyan, but then color corrected, it comes right back. 
so you can bring the color right back. And the good ones will allow for that. They will allow for you to correct the back, the color, if it does do a little bit of a shift on you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Graduated neutral density filters. So when and why do I use them? Um, <clears throat> so here we have a scene and the, um, the sky is kind of a, a little more washed out. Uh, so I applied a soft graduated neutral density filter and you can see that it richened up the color quite a bit. Uh, I feathered it actually into the water just a little bit to kind of give it a real smooth transition. And um, it creates a little bit more visual interest from the foreground to the sky. Again, here's a scene, no graduated uh, filter. And then I applied, in this case, I used a one and a half stop hard plus a three stop soft. So one of the things that you'll notice if you know filtering, there is a type of filter that I didn't mention in the very beginning, and that's called a reverse graduated neutral density. And what the reverse graduated neutral density does is it gives you more density right in the uh, uh, in a band, sort of in the center of the filter, and then feathers that uh, neutral density back towards the top. And the typical one that is popular with most landscape photographers is called a 3-2. So it's three stops of neutral density in the center and two stops further up. And the idea being that when you photograph a sunrise like this, the brightest area of the scene is in that area where the sun is rising. So you need more neutral density there and less up above. Um, I started working with hard graduated neutral densities. And the difference between a hard and a soft is that a soft is very gradual in its change from uh, the, the clear part to the denser part. The hard has a very abrupt line. It's a very, it's, it's not razor sharp, but it's pretty abrupt where it changes from clear to the neutral density. And as I started playing around with the hard graduated neutral densities, I discovered that if I used a a lower one, about one and a half stops, that that one and a half stops because it's immediate, it's right now, as you apply it and you put it right along the horizon line and then I feather back the three stop soft higher in the holder so that what I've got is I've got one and a half stops throughout the whole thing and then the three stop soft I come in and I'm not putting it way down into the scene, but I'm using about maybe one to two stops of that up here. So I've got maybe three, three and a half stops up here, one and a half right on the horizon. And that sort of works in, sort of a fakes in, in a sense, a, a reverse, if you will. I like that effect better than the reverse. The reverse um, never, I, I didn't like it was always a standard width as far as the three stop before it feathered into the other, where this I have a little bit more um, control because I can play around with how far I bring that three stop or more to, if I'm using a four stop or whatever, how, how high up in the holder I'm using it, what that spread is between the horizon line and where I'm applying that extra filtering. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to pause and ask if there's questions on the graduated neutral densities. There's one question. Uh, can you put two filters in the holder at the same time? Yes, you can. And in, in fact, uh, I'm glad that they brought that up. You can put with the Nisi and the Benro system, um, you have three slots in front of the polarizing filter. So potentially you could use a total of four filters if you wanted to. You could use a polarizer plus three of the flat ones and it can be any combination. It can be a straight neutral density as well as the graduated uh, neutral densities. And that's very frequently what I will be doing. I will a lot of times have anywhere from the polarizer plus two or three additional filters in front of my lens. Um, and I will vary it 
as far as what it is, what the effect is that I want. I should note that um, I'm going to assume you you guys can see me, right, Daniel? You can you can see me. Yep. Yeah, the video. All right, my beautiful smiling mug. Uh, I'm just digging in my kit here to pull out a prop. So this is uh, this is your holder right here. And this attaches to the lens, and the filter slide um, in that holder. Okay, and then you adjust them up or down. So the graduateds are clear on the bottom, and dark on the top. One of the things that I see. The biggest problem that beginners have is they take these things and they slam these things down too far into the scene. So what they're doing is they're getting this graduated part way down into the scene where they don't want it. You should keep these things up fairly high. And that's why I use more than one because I might be working with a three or a four or a five stop but I'm not getting the full five stops. It's up here, it's up towards the top. I'm still working in the feathered area. So I might have a five stop graduated neutral density, but I'm only applying say anywhere from one to two, maybe three stops in the scene. So that's why I'll double up a lot of the times because I want a total of five stops in the sky, but I don't wanna be, putting this down so far that I get that into the bottom of the frame in an area where I don't want it. I just want to apply it in the sky. So I just use say two stops or two and a half stops from the five. And then I put another one in front of it and I feather that back too. And I usually keep them feathered back so that they are um, not exactly even. So when I add a second graduated neutral density, I'm not, they're not totally even on the top, but rather, um, this is a lot easier on the camera than it is trying to hold it, that I, I feather it back just a little bit so that um, you can see that there, there's, there's a staggeredness to it, uh, to, the, to the scene. So I don't have that abrupt change. It's more of a feather and it's more gradual. Looks Wait. like there were more comments that popped up. More questions, yep, maybe? Two questions. One question is, what's the difference between using the neutral density filter as you're talking there versus the graduated filter within uh, Photoshop or Lightroom? Um, <clears throat> there, again, there isn't a whole lot of difference provided your camera has the ability to see the dynamic range that's in the scene. Your camera has a limited dynamic range. If you're working with a Canon, it's somewhere 11 to 12. If you're working with a Sony, it's 13 to 14. Whatever it is, your camera has a certain dynamic range that it sees as far as stops of light. If you have a scene that's extremely bright and dark in the foreground, it could supersede what the camera is. So no amount of post-process is gonna bring it out because the camera couldn't capture it. So that the filters give you additional dynamic range that's hitting the sensor because you're pre-adjusting it. Um, and I need to add and state that this, my images are not done when I filter them. When I bring them in for post-processing frequently, I don't use a graduated uh, neutral density filter in, post, in Photoshop. I do it a little bit differently, but I'm essentially doing the same thing, applying like a graduated, many times applying a, a graduated neutral density filter again to the scene to get exactly what I want as far as the depth or the darkness of the sky. Uh, I like a lot of drama in my photographs, not so much in my life, but I like them in my photographs. I want those skies to be dark. I want them to be foreboding a lot of times. I want those clouds to look uh, uh, very um, dramatic. So uh, the filters get me part of the way there. I'm only getting part of the way there. I finish it off in post-process. But if the cameras can't uh, capture it, you're not gonna, there's no amount of post-processing that's gonna be able to bring it out. Also, as I said, I like to fiddle, so. And the second question was, 
assuming that those filters are held in place by friction so they just don't fall out as you're playing yes. with them. Yep. So the, 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 the better holders are, they're very well machined. And so yes, that, that you, you just use friction. I have seen holders that they develop and they have a little gear system that you turn. I don't like those. I, I prefer the, just the, 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 a well-made holder that just uses the friction. They're easy. Normally it's easy when it's mounted to a lens. It's much easier than what you saw me fumbling with. I will note that if you have a, um, a Benro, a brand new Benro, the biggest complaint I had was people say, I can't get the filters through. When the Benros are brand new, they're very, very tight. And you really have to muscle those uh, filters up and down. But if you use it just a little bit, it, it, it loosens up and it becomes much smoother. Yeah, I know what you mean. It sounds like you feel like you're going to break, uh, break the filter. Right. Yeah. Could we go back uh, to the previous slide? Mm hmm I think we can. Yeah, this one. This looks like you have a, uh, a straight neutral density on it also. I mean, I do. Really yes, yes, I do. I, I eliminated that in this discussion to not confuse things, but I'll get into that more a little later. But yeah. you're right, um, Alan, I do have a straight neutral density on in this one to, to elongate the exposure. Yeah, so this would be a good example for uh, Deb who asked the question about uh, multiple filters. You actually have three filters on this one then. That's correct. Yep. Okay, thank you. Sure. So just so we're playing around, here's um, no filters. Here is the scene photographed with a four-stop neutral density to smooth out the water and a three-stop soft uh, to uh, bring in the clouds in that upper corner, which were just going white. I might add that one of the things that's really nice about these systems is that when you mount this on your lens, there's, no, uh, there's nothing that says you have to keep it perfectly straight up and down in orientation. You can turn it any way you want. So in this case, I turned it at roughly about a 40, 45 degree angle, not quite 45, maybe 30, whatever it was, turned it so that when I applied it, I'm only putting that filtration in into the upper left-hand corner uh, and not getting it into the rest of the scene. Um, so this is a straight scene. Here I have applied, a, again, a four-stop neutral density so that I can slow it down, smooth that water down. And I applied a three stop soft and I used it upside down so that the, uh, the density was on the bottom because you'll see that the water sort of goes white down here and it was blasting out. There was more light actually in the foreground because uh, it, as you look back into the forest, it gets darker because there's more tree cover and there's more light in the foreground. So I wanted to sort of filter down the foreground to blend it with that lower light area in the background of the image. So I used it upside down in this case. Here is a, um, a three stop uh, soft graduated filter. This is out in uh, Bryce uh, during a sunrise. And one of the things that I, I get asked frequently is, yeah, but when I use these filters, I, I'm going to filter any, any element that's in the foreground, which in this case is the, this tree, this old dead tree that I used as a foreground element. And you'll see that it darkened it down. It became a silhouette up towards the top. Um, and so it looks sort of weird because it's a dark at the top, but light at the bottom. And I find that in post-process, by using the shadow slider and opening up shadows, I can usually take care of most all of that problem. It goes away and uh, I don't have to uh, uh, worry about unevenness and foreground element things because uh, I've just opened up the shadows. If it's not enough, just going in and opening up the shadows and I go in and do some creative uh, dodging uh, or burning and or burning of the scene to, to fix whatever that might be. 
Looks like we might have another couple questions. Yep, one question, is there a wrong way to put in a filter? And I got one other after that. Um, you know, I read, I think it was Lee stated at some point, I saw in their materials, they said, make sure that the writing is facing you. And so I, I've always sort of done that. And I don't have any idea whether, I, I haven't noticed any difference in myself. So I don't know if there's a, if that's a, a true or not, or whether they just want you to always read their logo or label when you put it in. But um, I, most of the time, that's what I do. But I don't think there's really, no, I don't think there's a right or wrong way. Not that I've seen. And the other question is, when you're attaching this system to the lens only or to the hood, or does it matter? Basically, how does it attach to the lens is kind of the question. Sure. So there's two parts to the holder system um, with, with this system as well as with any of these um, slot or flat filter systems. You have a ring, and that ring attaches to the lens on your filter threads. So this ring needs to be the same millimeter size as your filter thread. If you have a 77 millimeter filter that you use, you would use a 77 millimeter ring, or if you have a 72 or whatever. Now, most of these systems will come with one size, either, and most modern pro lenses start at 82 as being the, sort of the largest that you can filter with a 100 millimeter system. So you would get an 82 millimeter ring, and then you would just have step up rings to go from the 77 to the 82, or the 72 to the 82, or what, 67 to the 82, whatever the, the filter size of your particular lens that you're applying it to. So you only buy one holder for all your lenses, and then you just use step up rings to adapt it, adapt it to the various size lenses that you have. Once you attach this ring, then you attach the, um, the other part to it, um, which, as I said, this is easier when it's on a camera than trying to hold the whole thing. But you would just attach this other part that holds the, the filters onto uh, that ring. And so uh, that's how it attaches to your camera. That it? That's it for the moment. All right. Oops. I think I, I showed that, didn't I? Okay. Well, so why, why, shooting cascades and, and waterfalls um, to get the nice smooth water so it's not so chunky looking, um, you need to smooth out the exposure. So here I have no filter. I'm at 1 60th of a second, F13, ISO is 400. Just Let's sort of pick a shot. Now, with this particular camera, if I choose a slower ISO and go down to the slowest ISO that the camera has, which is 100, stop the lens all the way down uh, to F16, I get one tenth of a second. It is smoother, but it's not perfectly smooth. It's not silky smooth. Usually, if you want to get that really nice, smooth look to the water, you wanna be shooting at least one second. You want your exposure to be at least one second in duration. Um, anywhere from, I find that waterfalls typically look best from about two to eight seconds is what I target for my waterfalls to give it that nice smooth look. Uh, so in this case, I had to use a six stop neutral density filter. I got to 13 seconds. I'm stopped down a little bit, maybe a little more than I needed to. And actually I went down to ISO 50 on this particular camera, but that's the settings. I, I find if there's a most used filter for waterfalls, it's the six stop. Um, that I, I, that's why I, I carry a four, a six and a 10. And the six stop for waterfalls is one of my favorites. It usually does the trick. Sometimes you can get by with less. This particular one is a four-stop uh, four neutral density uh, 
with the um, CPL, the, the, the polarizing lens, and then a, a graduated neutral density. Uh, so this, I used a four stop because it was an overcast day, uh, three stop soft to bring out some of those clouds. And here uh, I'm using a four stop neutral density and uh, the polarizing filter to richen up the greens. Uh, and I get a nice silky smooth look. Again, both of these last ones are roughly in that um, six, eight second range for um, shutter speeds. <clears throat> this is a, this was a particularly sunny day. And um, <laughs> this one, if you see these, uh, these leaves down here, which have a little splash of light on them, uh, this was a particularly long uh, exposure because I was using the 10 stop into density. So for a, uh, a good portion of the exposure, I used my body to block the sunlight that was falling on these foreground leaves right here. And then about a third, two thirds of the way through the exposure, I just stepped off to the side. So it, it just splashed a little bit of the light on them so they didn't burn out uh, really intensely, but just offered a little bit lighter. Um, light on those. So I'm going to use a section here on, that I call using time to create effects. Um, and a lot of this is based on Lake Superior, which is very close to you guys. And a lot of you get up there to use. So it, it would vary depending on the body of water, certainly and the activity of the water. There's a lot of variables here. So these are just sort of general some general rules of thumb for you to use to, as, as a jumping off point for your own experimentation while you're photographing. So here I have a six stop neutral density, which results in a 25 second exposure at F16. And it smooths the lake out quite a bit. Um, I find that if you wanna create a smooth effect to the lake, Lake Superior, you need to get the exposure to about 30 seconds that that will smooth out the water on the lake um, and create a nice uh, uh, sort of mirror or foggy look depending on the activity. Now here, what I've done is, this is very close to the same scene, but without using a filter, uh, so for neutral density that is, I've used a graduated to bring the sky down on both of these, but as far as, as neutral, overall neutral density to control the time, I have used about a one and a half second exposure, something close to what you would use for a waterfall. And it gives, and I timed it as the wave came in and flowed over that rock. So you get that nice um, smooth waterfall sort of look at about that one and a half second. Um, and I'm F11 at ISO 400 in order to do that. This previous one, had water washing over that rock in the same place, but because it was such a long exposure, it didn't record any of it. So I had to shorten up the exposure in order to capture that sort of little mini waterfall, if you will. Now, what I, whoops, what I sacrificed in that was that the lake itself is not as smooth. You get more of the ripples from the, the, the wave action in the lake. Similar situation here, six stop, new to density, 30 seconds. It's gonna smooth that water right out. If you wanna start using creative effects where you're using the wave action to create texture in the yes. foreground as it washes over those rocks, you've gotta shorten that up. And I find that anywhere from about one second to about three seconds works well for this effect where you can capture that water as it sort of flows over those foreground rocks, creating interesting textures and, and visuals. So your target for that needs to be a considerably faster shutter speed. So in this case, I'm, always, I'm going all the way up to 800 and I'm opening up the aperture to F9. Um, and that is that relationship between you're working with your ISO, your aperture, your shutter speed, of course, 
and then whatever filters that you're applying. Um, and most modern cameras can go anywhere from 100 to 400 without batting an eye. You don't have to worry much about noise between 100 and 400 with any camera that's made in the last three, four, maybe even five years. Certainly, you can interchange those. You're not going to see much difference. Slight amount of dynamic range difference, perhaps, but not much. If you're working with wide angle lenses, you're not going to see a whole lot of difference in depth of field between shooting at about f9, maybe to f16. If anything, using a more open aperture is going to give you a sharper image rather than stopping down too much to f16 or f22, which where you can start getting aperture diffraction, which softens the image. So using something more in that middle range, f13 to f11, those are not going to give you any much difference that you're going to see in depth of field with a wide angle lens in most scenic uh, landscapes. So I consider those things as variables that I can do with the various neutral densities that I have. I pick in my mind, I look at the scene as I'm playing around with my filters and trying different effects, and I pick a target as far as what it is that I want to create. What visual effect do I want to create in the image? Do I want texture in the foreground with the wave flat, splashing across the rock? Or do I want to smooth the whole lake out? And so if I want to smooth the whole lake out, I need to get it so that it's shooting at 30 seconds or even longer. Uh, if I want to create that texture in the foreground, I need to shorten it up so I'm shooting somewhere around one to three seconds. And these are the different now this one if you want to get into some really um more dynamic uh movement say with clouds or in this case grasses where i really wanted to soften the grasses you need to you know really kind of stomp on it some more you need to come uh, uh bring your neutral density up probably you're pulling your 10 stop out in order to um, create this effect and you need to get into some much, much longer exposures. Um, so if you really want to blur the clouds, you need to get up into the minutes. Uh, so 10 stops is, is what you need to create those nice effects where you've smeared the clouds across a scene. Um, and that, that requires a much longer. I talked a little bit about this, the relationship between the ISO, the shutter speed, and the aperture when you're using your filters. And basically what I do is I think in terms of what, it's the opposite of what a lot of has been drilled into so many landscape photographers, myself included for years. What's my aperture? What's my depth of field? And I would submit to you that in most landscape photographs, you're not gonna notice a hoot of difference between F11 and, and F16. So you have some room to move there with the aperture but you are gonna notice a lot of difference between, as I showed you, between a exposure of a couple seconds and say 30 seconds. So you start thinking in terms of shutter speed, not in terms of aperture. What do I want my shutter speed to be? And then you apply the either the filtration, the ISO change or the aperture change to hit that target shutter speed that you want to create the effect that you want. <clears throat> this is a very long exposure, as you can see, it's uh, several minutes long. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, I'm going to skip by that because that's, um, you saw that, what was in the filter kit in the first one. I should have taken that slide out. I apologize. <laughs> it's an older slide. Um, I would say that the biggest problem that I see most beginners have, besides 
the, the neutral, they're applying the, the graduated neutral density filters too far into the holder. The second problem, which is actually the, the first biggest problem that most beginning landscape photographers have, they say, I, I don't understand filters. I don't know how to, how to use them. The way that I work is when I go into a scene that I want to photograph, the first thing that I ask myself is, what lens do I want to use? How wide of a view do I want? Do I want a really wide lens or do I want my normal uh, telephoto, 24 to 70 range, or do I want something a little longer? So I select the lens that I want to use. The second thing that I do is put the filter holder on the front of that lens. Now I'm ready to filter. The third thing I do is take that filter kit and I hang it across my, I, it, it comes with this great strap, comes with a great shoulder strap, has this, you know, the kit, you know, this nice strap. And I just take that thing and, you know, I, I put it on. And I've got my filters right here, they're right by my side. And the holder's on the lens, ready to use. Now I can apply the filters. So the biggest problem that most beginners have is they, they don't do that. They don't put the holder on. If you don't put the holder on, you're not going to use the filters. You put the holder on, you'll start using the filters and you'll start playing around with it. You'll start be able to see how you can creatively use them to change a scene and make it more dynamic. Uh, this one I didn't have the specs on. Uh, I apologize. I'm using a, a, a four and five stop soft graduated neutral density and a six stop neutral density for, to slow it down. I've got a, a, a 30 second exposure here um, with uh, the sky being filtered down quite a bit. Now that caused the lighthouse to go dark right across here in the middle of the lighthouse. But using the shadow slider and post process, I, I was able to open it up. I did a little bit of additional dodging in here to kind of just open up the the front of the lighthouse a little bit more. This is a five stop soft graduated neutral density to bring the clouds out. Here I have a circular polarizer, a st six stop neutral density to give it that 30 second exposure and a three stop soft to feather back to, to darken the sky a little bit more. Circular polarizer, four stop neutral density, and a three stop soft graduated. This one I thought uh, it was a very unusual scene. I mean, it's sort of like, why did they build that house there? <laughs> How do they get to it? The door is about 10 feet up. Do they wait for high tide all the time? <laughs> This question, this, this scene asks a lot of questions that I can't answer. So it was sort of surreal. And so I wanted to emphasize that and chose to go with a 10 stop. The, the clouds were moving pretty well so I could get a longer exposure and, and really create that dynamic aspect to the scene. I would say that if there's a difference in the way that I filter by what I'm seeing in the scene, if I'm shooting and I'm thinking in terms of black and white, I tend to filter the skies heavier. I tend to use more um, neutral density in the sky, apply it more too, to darken up the clouds more than with color. Color tends, I tend to leave that a little bit lighter, a little more uh, pastel -y as far as the color than I do if I'm thinking in terms of black and white. <clears throat> I have a question from an image of way back. All right. Take it. You had that image with the 220 seconds, what were you trying to achieve by having such a long exposure? 
Um, I wanted to blur the clouds a little bit more so that they became less def definable in that scene. I liked the colors that were in the sky, and I just wanted to create it more of a, in a sense, a painterly effect with the clouds so that they were smeared off across the, the sky a little bit more. And as I said, in order to do that, in order to blur those clouds, you have to get up into multiple minutes, typically, unless the clouds are really booking. Um, but most of the time, you've got to get up into a minute to two, maybe four minutes to, to blur them. Looks like we might have a few other questions. We can, we can take those. Yeah. Another question is, is, what's the approximate cost to get set up in a system like this? Yeah, um, unfortunately, the last, they, Nisi just came out with this version seven holder this last fall. And the last time I saw, they did not have a kit yet for that. Um, the Benro kits were selling, uh, the starter kits were selling for uh, uh, not quite $400, about $389 for the, the starter kit. And what that gave you was, gave you the holder, it gave you the circular polarizer, it gave you a neutral density, four stop neutral density, and a three stop graduated soft neutral density. Nisi is gonna be very similar in price. Uh, so, and it gave you a, a the, the ben, Benro gave you a little uh, bag or kit, but I, I never liked that. It was really hard to work with. Uh, I like the Nisi bag much, much more. It's it's slings across your shoulder and you can work with it. Um, so you're going to probably to jump in and sort of get a basic starter with a with a holder polarizer, uh, a one graduate or one neutral density, one graduated. You're going to be spending around uh, four hundred bucks for this. Now a lot of people like four hundred dollars. What you nuts? And what I would say to you is this, is I would say, okay, um, if you want to go out and buy a lens for your camera to give you more um, creative ability, what are you going to spend? You're going to spend at least $400 for a decent lens, probably a whole lot more, probably closer to $1,000. Well, with this filter system, you can put it on all your lenses. It's going to give you a tremendous amount of creative ability uh, that can be applied. Um, and do yourself a favor, learn from what I did. <laughs> I have a drawer full of old filters. Don't buy cheap filters. You're not saving money. You're creating headaches. Uh, invest in a good system. Um, I'll take other questions. And one other question out there is, have you ever used a red, orange, yellow for black and white? No, I have not. <clears throat> I, I've simply shot uh, with the regular filters. As I said, I, I tend to filter the sky more with the graduated neutral densities um, to, to add a little bit more uh, drama to the clouds typically, but that's the only adjustment I do for black and white. And then convert. John, I have a question. Uh, Phil Davies, I, I was I uh, on your UP Waterfalls uh, yeah. workshop. Uh, good times. Got to do another one soon. Uh, but I have a question about um, using ACR when we're talking about um, uh, ND grads, so do, you, do you have a rule of thumb about when to use an, a, an ND grad and or HDR, or in some cases, do you use both uh, in your images? Uh, you're talking about uh, the the Adobe Camera Raw graduated filter in the... No, and I'm talking about if you're in the field and you, you have a decision to when you want to... Uh, uh, control the dynamic range. You you could use an ND grad filter to light to darken the sky, or you could uh, simply shoot HDR, and, and then you avoid uh, effects like like the, the the shadow tree and the shadowed lighthouse. So so in some instances, you, you would you make a decision? I'm going to use HDR rather than the filter. 
Or in oh. some cases, would you use perhaps use both? Yeah, HDR. HDR. I was hearing. I was mishearing you. I'm sorry, Phil. Right, right. HDR. Um, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't like HDR personally. I, I just I don't like it. I think it gives the image a sort of a process look that I don't care for. Um, you know, I, I that's my own deal. You know, if you don't have it, then great. You don't have to worry about it. You can use HDR. Uh, you don't have to worry about things like trying to fix uh, the, the foreground elements. Uh, again, it's, 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 it's the, um, for me, it's the aesthetic of working in the field. The aesthetic of working in the field is using the filters and using the filters because I can fiddle around with them and they make me think about the scene more um, rather than saying, oh, I'm just going to shoot it, I'll fix it later. Uh, I mean, that doesn't mean that I aren't, I'm not doing work later. I am I'm working on these things all the way through to the very end. The filters start me down a path that uh, I finish later on with a post process. Um, but I don't use HDR. That's, I just, I, philosophically, again, it's sort of a, um, you know, I, I like to say that I spend half my time thinking up these philosophies uh, by which drive the work that I do. And then I spend the other half of my time trying to figure out how I can live within these boxes that I've created for myself. So um, the images, the, the, the work that you see from me is one, one image, one shot, a single opening and closing of the shutter. That's a photograph. If you do something else, if you're using HDR, that's multiple opening and closing of the uh, shutter. It's no longer a photograph. It's, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it a photographic illustration. You can call it a photographic composite. Um, I don't care. You can call it whatever you want. That's fine. There's some very good work that's photographic composites or photographic illustrations but it's not a photograph. And HDR is not a photograph. It's multiple photographs that have been composited together. So again, that's a philosophical thing. And that's the, the philosophy that I work under and that's the box I created for myself. So that's, that's what I do. <laughs> I think there's one technical reason for that as well, is if you're doing long exposures and then you're doing HDR, you're now having to take several long exposures and then with a long exposure, you're, try you're trying to catch things moving and smear them. Well, now you're going to have three different smears in different places. I, I mm -hmm. have a filter system like this, and I like shooting the eight, the long exposures just like you do. And that's one area that you can't make up with with the HDRs. If you're mixing the long exposures, it just doesn't come together well. Versus having the the ND plus the graduated ND now allows you, as you said, capture the entire thing in the one shot and everything's moving together and you don't have these just these components that are now in different places in the different 30 second exposures or one minute exposures yep thank you john and dan that's sure. uh, for you, uh, sharing your philosophy i appreciate it sure